today, as the House knows, we are dealing with Bill C-60, the first Conservative omnibus bill following their 2013 budget. It's a bit less abusive, Mr. Speaker, than Bill C-38 and C-45 from last year, but it is still an omnibus measure lumping together various unrelated matters. By my count, at least 18 different government portfolios are implicated. And at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, the government is going to force a single vote on all of that all at once. And that, of course, renders the vote so meaningless because it, cross, it cu cuts across so many unrelated disciplines. And again, democracy is compromised in the process. There are some uh, items, uh, Mr. Speaker, for sure in Bill C-60, which people could generally support. Uh, better allowances for veterans, for example, dealing with the adoption tax credit, more incentives for charitable giving, uh, the extension of capital cost allowance, and additions to the gas tax transfer, for example. But these positive things are intermingled, unfortunately, with many very negative measures, especially large tax increases that will hit and hurt middle-class Canadians in particular, and we cannot and we will not support those negative measures. Budget 2013 is crafted to feed several false illusions. The first of those is the mythical notion that these Conservatives are the competent economic managers that they claim to be. But let's look at the facts. When they took office in 2006, they inherited from their Liberal predecessors 10 straight years of balanced budgets, an annual surplus that was running at the rate of $13 billion every year, lower debt, lower taxes, low and stable interest rates, a sound and solid Canada pension plan, steadily dropping employment insurance premiums, annual economic growth rates of 3% or better, the best banking system in the world, the best ever transfer payments to provinces and territories, progressive investments in childcare, skills and learning, science and innovation, environmental integrity, infrastructure, trade, and three and a half million net new jobs. That's what the Conservatives inherited. That's what was handed to them as a starting point in 2006. Now, just as an interesting historical sidebar, Mr. Speaker, before these Conservatives inherited 10 years of Liberal balanced budgets and robust surpluses, the last time a Conservative government actually balanced a budget for Canada was 101 years ago in 1912. The Prime Minister at the time was Robert Borden, originally a school teacher, as a matter of historical fact. He too inherited his surplus from a Liberal predecessor, namely Sir Wilfrid Laurier, but sadly he managed to maintain it for only one year before dropping into surplus. This current Conservative government has behaved in a similar manner. Through excessive spending and reckless budgeting between 2006 and 2008, they put Canada back into the red again before, not because of, before the recession, which hit in the latter part of 2008. And they haven't balanced the books ever since. Now, in Budget 2013, the Conservatives claim that they will eliminate the deficit hocus-pocus by 2015. Now, isn't that convenient? Just on the eve of the next federal election, they're projecting a balanced budget. A close look at their financial plans provides ample reason to be just a little bit suspicious. And here are some of the fiscal tricks. First of all, rosy growth estimates. To puff up government revenues, the Conservatives have based their fiscal planning on optimistic projections about economic growth. They ignore the reality that in years just past, their numbers have never, ever been correct. Time and time again, their initial forecasts have had to be downgraded as both the International Monetary Fund and the Bank of Canada have just done once again in this last month. Secondly, deficient reserves. To create the illusion of more financial flexibility and strength than they really have, the Conservatives have 
lowballed the reserves that should be in place to serve as fiscal shock absorbers for Canadians against unpleasant future economic surprises. The amounts set aside should grow in the outer years because, of course, the risk is larger in the outer years. But this government has foolishly flatlined flat their reserves going forward, meaning they are not protecting adequately against future risk. Thirdly, exaggerated lapses. When a government department doesn't use all the budget in any given year that is given to it, the excess money naturally lapses back to the central treasury. The Conservatives, in their budget, are counting on very large lapses over the next, six, ne next several years. In fact, that's worked right into their arithmetic. In other words, they are planning to make big announcements, a big, big new spending plans, but never actually invest the money. Number four, excessive optimism about catching those tax cheats. While cracking down on those who don't pay their rightful taxes is an absolute necessity, the Conservatives' claim of a balanced budget depends very heavily on quickly collecting billions in unpaid taxes. And that seems highly probable, highly improbable, at a time when they're chopping the resources needed in the Revenue Department to go after those tax cheaters. Number five, big program cuts. For big programs like infrastructure, the government claims to be increasing its investment. But any hypothetical increase actually occurs only years down the road, beyond the mandate of this parliament sometime in the latter part of this decade, well after, conveniently, 2015. It's a trick that is called multi-year bundling and back-end loading. When you haven't got anything really to announce, you roll a bunch of years together and pretend you're going to spend money five or ten years down the road while you actually cut in the short term. And that's what's happening here. In reality, the Build Canada infrastructure budget has been cut by $1.5 billion this year, $1.5 billion next year, and $1 billion in the year after that. Any hypothetical increase is only well after the year 2015. And number six, Mr. Speaker, claiming before proving. Using all of the tricks that I've just mentioned to concoct the false notion of a balanced budget by 2015, the Conservatives will claim that they have met their fiscal objective just before they call an election and before, importantly, before proof to the contrary can become available. In the normal financial cycle, the audit report on the government's books for 2015 won't get published until much later. That is well into 2016, long after any election has come and gone. Well, so much, Mr. Speaker, for the conservative illusion of fiscal and economic competence. Their second illusion is that they really care about jobs and job training, and they boast about their proposed new jobs grant. The Minister of Human Resources Development mentions it in the House almost every day. But again, Mr. Speaker, it's a fiction. It's spin. It's make-believe. It doesn't, in fact, exist. What exists are labor market agreements and they have existed since the late 1990s. Job training agreements between the Government of Canada and all the provinces. The latest versions of these labour market agreements were negotiated about five years ago, and they are worth now about $2.5 billion altogether. Federal money that is regularly transferred every year by the Government of Canada to the provinces. And the provinces use those funds to tailor job training and labor market programs and services that suit their local circumstances. The provinces are in charge of the design. That is what exists now. Well, this federal government wanted to appear to be doing something about skills and jobs in the 2013 budget. People without jobs and jobs without people 
is one of Canada's biggest economic problems in the present time. The government wanted to look as if it were aware of that and doing something about it. But this government wasn't prepared to invest any new money to try to make an actual difference in terms of job training. So what they did do was to create this illusion of action, the fiction that they were doing something about jobs and training. What they're basically proposing to do is to claw back the labor market money that they now send to the provinces, that $2.5 billion per year, and renegotiate it with provincial governments. That's all. It amounts to recycling existing money. There is nothing more, there is nothing new, there is no additional federal investment. The provinces will need to contribute more, and so will the private sector, and that may actually serve to reduce the extent of job training in some sectors and some provinces, because some of those other partners, provinces or the private sector, may not be able to match the federal dollars. Even Alberta, the provincial treasurer in Alberta, has made the comment that he doesn't know whether Alberta would want to participate in that kind of an initiative. But the bottom line here, Mr. Speaker, is no new money, no additional federal investment in training. It is an illusion to try to create the impression that something new is happening when it's not. And that's tragic, Mr. Speaker, especially for young Canadians looking for some hope and opportunity. And here are the numbers. More than 212,000 fewer young Canadians are working today than just before the recession began in 2008. The youth unemployment rate is a very stubborn 14.2 percent. That is nearly twice the rate for other Canadians. The actual number is 404,000 jobless young people. Worse still, another 171,000 have simply given up and dropped out of the labour market altogether. Yet this government and this budget do nothing but shuffle the deck chairs on the Titanic. And that is simply not good enough. Mr. Speaker, another fiction, the third one, is this government's bogus claim that it does not increase taxes. Well, that assertion is completely false, and that's one of the key reasons why we cannot support Bill C-60, because it increases taxes, especially the tax burden of middle-class Canadians and all those who are working so hard to join the middle class. It happens in dozens of nefarious ways. New hidden conservative taxes on safety deposit boxes, that's $40 million a year. And on certain medical services, that's $2 million a year. And new conservative taxes on credit unions, that's $75 million a year, and so on. But there are three hidden conservative tax hikes that hit, hit especially hard at the middle class. Taxes on small business dividends, taxes on payrolls, and taxes on imported consumer goods. First, that conservative small business tax, a new tax burden on small businesses, will absorb $550 million every year, taking that from small business and hurting the middle class. The second new conservative tax is this EI payroll tax, which will suck up $600 million every year in higher EI premiums, again, hurting the middle class. Now, by contrast, Mr. Speaker, facing a job challenge in the 1990s, a Liberal government did not increase EI payroll taxes. We, in fact, cut them. We cut them 12 consecutive times. We cut them by 40 percent. Employers and employees saved billions of dollars, and three and a half million net new jobs were generated. This government's record is the opposite of that. And finally, Mr. Speaker, the third tax, the tax increase that we object to is the new conservative uh, increase of tariff taxes. These are taxes on imports, and that is going to take from middle-class Canadians about $333 million every year. 
The cost of vacuum cleaners will go up by 5%. Bicycles will go up by 4.5%. Baby carriages will go up by 3%. Plastic school supplies will go up by 3.5%. Scissors by 11%. Ovens, cooking stoves, and ranges will go up by 3%. Coffee makers, the cost will increase by 4%. On wigs, especially cosmetic wigs for cancer patients, Mr. Speaker, the cost will go up by a whopping 15.5%. USB drives, the cost will go up by 6%. On blankets, the cost will go up by 5%. On toothbrushes, Mr. Speaker, the cost will go up by 2%. On pillows, the cost will go up by 6%. On alarm clocks, the cost will go up by 6%. Mr. Speaker, dozens and dozens and dozens of imported products. And the government's excuse for this is that you, uh, you only want uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, provide these, these, uh, these um, higher tariffs uh, in order to uh, give a benefit to a, uh, a lower income uh, country overseas. But Mr. Speaker, the reality is when you put on these tariff increases, the country overseas doesn't levy the tax. The country overseas doesn't pay the tax. The, the tax is levied in Canada and it is paid by Canadians. The burden is on average middle income Canadian families. This is a self-inflicted cost burden in Canada, and that's why we can't support it. Mr. Speaker, when all of these measures that I've mentioned are fully implemented, these and some other taxes that are, that are buried in this legislation, the burden will add up to more than $2 billion per year in new conservative taxes that are being levied on Canadians. And the largest portion of that burden, Mr. Speaker, will fall squarely on the backs of middle-class families. So for substantive reasons of public policy today, we will not vote for these measures, but also because the government is trying to hide these new taxes and deny them, we cannot sanction such deceit. Such deceit. And so, Mr. Speaker, Liberals oppose Bill C-60, and I would move, seconded by the member for Westmount, Bill Marie, that the motion be amended by deleting all the words after the word that and substituting the following. Quote, the House declined to give second reading to Bill C-60, an act to implement certain provisions of the budget tabled in Parliament on March 21st, 2013, and other measures because it, A, raises taxes on middle-class Canadians in order to pay for the Conservatives' wasteful spending. B, fails to reserve pardon me, fails to reverse the government's decision to raise tariffs on items such as baby carriages, bicycles, household water heaters, space heaters, school supplies, ovens, coffee makers, wigs for cancer patients, and blankets. C, raises taxes on small business owners by $2.3 billion over the next five years, directly hurting 750,000 Canadians and risking Canadian jobs. D, raises taxes on credit unions by $75 million per year, which is an attack on rural Canadians and Canada's rural economy. E, adds GST, HST to certain health care services, including medical work that victims of crime need to establish their cases in court. F, fails to provide a youth employment strategy to help struggling young Canadians find work. And G, ignores the pressing requirements of Aboriginal peoples. And I move that, Mr. Speaker, seconded by the member for Westmount, Bill Murray.